inside the Niger Delta. After almost six decades of its existence as part of Nigeria, the Niger Delta is yet to get the attention it deserves as a nation's treasure base, a situation that is blamed on an existing leadership vacuum in the region. Who will succeed the receding generation of leaders who once championed the cause of the Niger Delta and offer the region a strong voice in an increasingly complex political terrain? That is the focus of this special report. Many years before Nigeria's liberation from colonial rule in 1960, the Niger Delta had been identified as a politically and economically threatened region in an emerging nation state. At the vanguard of the struggle for self-rule were some Niger Deltans, notably Ernest Ikoli, Anthony Enaro, Okoya Ripo, among several others who, in concert with their counterparts from other regions, fought assiduously to dislodge the Union Jack from the soil of what eventually became Nigeria. Sensing that the politics of the day was being compromised by an unhealthy rivalry among the large ethnic groups scrambling for an equitable share of national resources in pre-independence Nigeria, leaders of the less populated Niger Delta region had raised fears about their welfare and survival in post-independence Nigeria. Such fears were confirmed by the Willings Commission report of 1948 that designated the Niger Delta an area of special attention for rapid development. At independence, a gold mine was struck in the Niger Delta with the discovery of crude oil in Oloibri in 1956. Shortly after the Civil War ended in 1970, crude oil became Nigeria's economic mainstay and produce vast economic resources that successive governments used to develop other regions, leaving out the Niger Delta as the Cinderella of national budgetary allocations. Following crude oil exploration in the Niger Delta was a massive pollution of the environment that saw the communities dislocated from their means of livelihood. The consequences of administrative neglect in Nigeria's oil-rich but largely backward region has been an untold ecological devastation, poverty and insecurity. It is otherwise known as the Niger Delta question. The Palo state of affairs in the Niger Delta in the intervening years resulted in a non-violent struggle for an existence in the region. Championed by the likes of Ken Sarawiwa and Chiefs Harold Dapabirie and Edwin Clark. As it stands now, Chief Edwin Clark appears to be the lone and retiring voice which the region badly needs to be accorded its pride of place in national affairs. We all belong to this country. This country does not belong to one group of people. Some people are free men or leaders. Or masters, or that are slaves, or second class citizens. We should learn from the lessons of Sudan and other countries. I'm not going to leave in Nigeria for, the, for my children who will be slaves. Enough is enough. In more recent times, the emergence of armed struggle following the Kayama Declaration of 1998 had prompted the federal government to make concessions for the region in its demand for social justice. In 1999, a policy was implemented to reserve 13% of oil revenues for the rapid development of the Niger Delta. This was followed by the establishment of the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, in the year 2000, and subsequently the Ministry of Niger Delta. In spite of the federal government's gesture, there is a general perception that its interventionist policies in the Niger Delta were ab initio designed to fail. The 13% derivation has not translated in the lives of the community, oil-bearing community. The 13% derivation is just extra money for governors to squander for their personal aggrandizement. In over three decades, calls for the operation of fiscal federalism have resonated the most in the Niger Delta, whose people are consistent in their demand for a restructured federation to enable them control oil revenues generated in their domain and pay royalties to the federal government. 
By also State Governor Henry Sariake Dixon is currently spearheading the campaign for a restructured federation, which he says will reposition the country on the path of justice, fairness, and national cohesion. The call for restructuring is a call for a return to the original founding principles of our great nation. And no blackmail, no intimidation to sway us to abandon this noble cause. Our nation is crying for justice. Our nation is crying for freedom. Our nation is crying for prosperity. Our nation is crying for unity. Unity that is sustainable. Unity that is founded on justice. People who are far away may just talk of restructuring as a slogan or as an ideal. Here in this state, here in this region, we feel the pains of it. We live with it, we have lived with it for decades and decades. And so when there is a call to reorganize our country and make it more stable, make it more equitable, make it more just, and therefore make it more prosperous, we in Bayelsa State, we in the John Nation are totally in support of that. In July 2017, the hopes for most Niger Deltans for a restructured federation were dashed when a bill seeking to amend the 1999 constitution to allow for devolution of more powers from the center to the federating units was rejected on the floor of the Senate. It was a sad experience for Niger Deltans who have since concluded that with lawmakers from outside the region in the majority in the National Assembly, addressing the Niger Delta question will continue to be an uphill task for their political representatives. The fear of those who are opposed to the increment is that they will not have anything to fall back on. We need to lobby other states to support us. The Santos Clause is a proposal whereby the oil resources, which right now is 13 percent, is given an incremental progression from 15 percent, from um, 13 percent, say to 20 percent, depends on our lobbying power in the first five years. After that, another increment of the 5 percent to 25 in another 10 years, to now 30 percent in another 20 years. Like that, you increase. You, don't, you won't get everything at once. Beyond the inequitable distribution of Niger's oil well to the detriment of the Niger Delta, there is a general perception of an orchestrated plan to continue to undermine the region and its people, as it was feared in the years preceding the release of the Willings Commission report. Governor Dixon, who doubles as chairman of the South-South Governors Forum, recently gave vent to the region's perceived feeling of political relegation in responding to the travails of the suspended Chief Justice of Nigeria, Walter Onoge. We consider this step, which is directly aimed at humiliating the nation's highest judicial officer, who incidentally is a prominent son of this nation, from the South-South Zone, we view this as totally unacceptable, as it is reflective of what we have come to know as a South-South story of endless marginalization and intimidation. With the implementation report on oil pollution in Ogoniland and the ongoing construction of the Boni Border Road, President Muhammad Buhari has made conscious efforts to provide new vistas of hope for the Niger Delta. Mr. President is, however, enjoined to go the extra mile to make the oil-producing communities real partakers in the distribution of the country's oil wealth in the next four years. Good enough that the oil leases are expiring. Some persons have benefited. It has also impacted and translated in their lives and that of their children. It should go round. This oil block should be given to communities so that they can it will also improve their, their entrepreneurship uh, profiles and they will now see themselves as equal stakeholder in these economic activities. And they will ensure that there is peace in the region. 
infrastructure wise we should plead with the president to complete the east to west road that is an important infrastructural program project for us if our goose cannot go out of near delta another can goose corn him coming businesses will suffer and businesses are suffering Port Harcourt City is starving. Lagos is booming. So if you hope to compete with Lagos, you must get the nature the, the East West Road done. The problems and challenges of the Niger Delta are indeed legion. Confronting these challenges successfully will require a leadership that is focused, dedicated, and result oriented. Also, it is imperative that the region begins to look beyond the 92-year-old Chief E.K. Clark and into the future. It must do so with a crop of new regional leaders that will speak for the entire region. One man whose thoughts and actions and experience as governor in the last seven years clearly puts him at a vantage position for regional leadership is Bielsa State Governor and Champion of Restructuring Honorable Henry Sariake Dixon. While Governor Sirake Dixon prepares to take over the baton of leadership from Chief E.K. Clark, the last man standing in the old guard of regional emancipators, it is clear that a lone voice cannot adequately convey to the rest of the country and indeed the international community the true aspirations of the Niger Deltans. Leaders of the Niger Delta, both those who are the, the elderly ones in court and the younger generation must come together and put aside political consideration and come to the point where we understand that the need of the Niger Delta is greater than our personal or political need. And I think that that must be done very quickly. Regardless of the fact that the Niger Delta question has given rise to a struggle in need of more volunteers, most of the region's leaders who have the obligation to champion the cause of their people have become divided on party lines. Their pursuit of personal aspirations has created a leadership vacuum in the region, which makes it appear like a rudderless ship in search of any port in a storm. It is expected that in the next four years of the Buhari presidency, Niger Deltans, irrespective of their social status and political affiliations, sink their differences and pursue the collective aspiration of a region long abandoned by the Nigerian state. Inside the Niger Delta, 